Good morning, everyone. And thank you for joining us today in the second of our Freight in the City webinar series in partnership with Dennis Eagle. My name's Hayley Pink and I'm the events editor for Freight in the City and will be your chair for the webinar. T today's event will focus on the electrification of refuse collection vehicles and take a look at some of the wider sustainable fuels testing taking place across the UK. We have three fantastic speakers lined up this morning from Dennis Eagle, Nottingham City Council and Zemo Partnership. They'll talk you through the latest technology, robust test cycles and practicality of electric RCVs on real life waste collection duties. Now, when it comes to waste collection, the idea of using electric bin wagons has been on the radar for a long, long time, it seems. Indeed, Commercial Motors editor shared with me last week a story from the magazine's archives from 1960 asking why electric lorries weren't being used for refuse collections back then. Although this article was, of course, written long before the environmental benefits of zero emission vehicles were widely talked about, Commercial, Mo Commercial Motor pointed out that electric bin wagons were considerably cleaner than traditional combustion lorries. Other obvious advantages included smooth acceleration, ease of driving and silent running. The key disadvantage noted was that they lacked performance, with most having a top speed in 1960, of course, of between 10 to 15 miles per hour. However, Commercial Motor then asked whether that was actually an issue, considering the average speed of traffic flow in London was between 8 and 12 miles per hour. 60 years later, and most of the capital's refuse trucks are still diesel powered, and the average traffic speed in central London is now 7.1 miles per hour. So perhaps now, using the latest technology, the time is finally right for the electric RCV to move into the mainstream. There's certainly an appetite from local authorities as they strive to reduce emissions and boost air quality for residents. We hope that today's session will help you in deciding. Well, that's enough from me. Time to bring in our speakers for today. They're each going to take turns to present and then we'll have time afterwards to answer any questions you may want to submit using the Q&A function on your Zoom screen. The full recording is going to be available to watch on demand on freightinthecity.com from tomorrow. So I'd like to introduce our first speaker for the morning, Andy Graves, Product Marketing Manager at Dennis Eagle. OK, over to you, Andy. Thank you. Good morning, Hayley, and hello to everyone. Thanks for uh, inviting us to uh, present on the eCollect. And of course, we've been working with Zemo, what was the low carbon vehicle partnership for some time. And of course, Nottingham City are a long-standing customer of ours. So it all ties together nicely in this presentation. So without further ado, I'll get started on the presentation. Dennis Eagle are part of the Turberg Ross Rocker Group. And here we show some key data for the UK companies who are part of the group. And of course, we concentrate on refuse vehicles, recycling vehicles. Um, but within the group, there are lots of other strings to our bow. But of course, what we're here today to talk about is electrification of refuse vehicles. Now, refuse vehicles do have a very demanding duty cycle. And when you consider that a distribution truck will probably average about nine miles per gallon when traveling on motorways, but that refuse collection vehicle may only achieve two to three miles per gallon when collecting waste. And of course, that's partly because there are lots of auxiliary loads, the compaction system, the bin nip system, uh, in cold weather, the heating system, in hot weather, maybe air conditioning. So lots of elements that help affect the range of the vehicle and of course the power consumption on the vehicle. The chart shown there is a, a simple representation of the low city refuse vehicle duty cycle, which of course we've been working with them to develop one for electric vehicles. You can't carry out all the tests in exactly the same way, but we've had to do track time rather than dynamometer testing to prove that the vehicle meets the performance requirements and also that it can do the job it's meant to, 
which generally is two or three collection rounds a day. Um, on average, it's around 10 tons of waste or domestic waste on each collection round. And of course, still be able to get back to the depot. So when we uh, decided to go for this project, there were some important design principles. And the first was that, was that we would change as little as possible on the vehicles by using the existing chassis bodies and lifter systems. They're tried and, tried and tested, well proven. And uh, of course, they're a benchmark for safety. And of course, we've carried over the five star direct vision standard elite cab to the e-collect as well. Just move to the next slide. Andy, um, just going to just going to stop you a second, if I can. Your slides aren't coming up. I'm just going to get them coming up for you. Bear with us oh, a second. Oh, sorry. <laughs> I'll, let me try sharing again. No problem. Let, let's give you get, let's see if it works again. Hang on. Give it a go now. Yeah. Perfect. That's that's better. Right. OK. My apologies. So hopefully you're seeing the slide with the, the back of a vehicle. The trouble is I can't see on the screen. Can you confirm that, Hayley? Yeah, we can see the back of the screen. Oh, yeah. Okay, yeah. Good. OK. So uh, we wanted to have a genuine alternative to our best selling refuse vehicle, which is a 26 ton narrow track vehicle with rear steer with a 19 cubic meter body and a, an automatic split lifter, normally the, the turbo Gomnidel. Right. Hopefully this next slide will come up OK. Yeah, all good. I think it's all working fine now. You're, right. you're good to go. <laughs> now, Battery technology has progressed significantly um, and lithium batteries, of course, uh, have increased energy density. They can be smaller and lighter than uh, lead acid batteries, which uh, some of the early vehicles that you talked about in your introduction might have used. And we're using lithium with nickel cobalt manganese chemistry, pretty much the same as in a Nissan Leaf, for example which also means that they've got a, a better life cycle and we expect them to last the, the life of the vehicle. But we've been building up a library of data where we've data log vehicles since about 2006, where we've looked at hybrid vehicles and other alternative fuels. And of course, the, the new chemistry within those batteries has meant that we're much more confident that the vehicles can perform as they should. Once we've decided to commit to the project, we had to select a configuration. Uh, and as I said before, we wanted to make minimal changes. So we're using standard Euro 6 braking and suspension systems and the steering systems. Really, all we're doing is taking away the engine and gearbox and replacing them with the electric motor, the driveline components to suit. And we have five battery packs, each of 60 kilowatt hour capacity. So a total of 300 kilowatt hour and a 200 kilowatt motor. When you're operating the vehicle, you will notice the instrument cluster changes slightly from the traditional diesel vehicle. There's a new gear change pad. We've got new programmable switches and there's also a, a tortoise warning that shows up for return to base. There's also a state of charge display rather than a fuel gauge, but otherwise it's just the same as driving one of our traditional vehicles. Apart from, of course, the fact that acceleration or certainly pick up at the low end is much better than on a diesel vehicle. The vehicle uses the CCS2 Combi smart charging protocol, which is an industry standard system. It's rated at uh, a nominal 50 kilowatt hour requirement at 63 amps, but it can work down at 32 amps, of course, with a slightly longer charging time. 
and that does need a 415 volt three phase system to supply it. So here a little bit more detail about the charger. We've opted for a, a mobile charger for our own vehicles. But of course, you can also go for a fixed charging system where there's a central supply system to satellite devices. But again, you need to have the high voltage, high ampage system to, to charge the vehicle. Maintenance and service is simpler. It's a bit early yet to, uh, to be able to confirm any true costings, but uh, we do expect them to be considerably lower than with a traditional diesel vehicle, particularly because there are no engine oil changes. The particulate filter is non-existent. It doesn't need changing or inspection or in cleaning. But of course, you do still have to service and maintain the brakes and so on. But of course, because you have energy recovery, brake performance uh, effectively is much better and there's less foundation brake use. So disc pads should last much longer than with a traditional vehicle. The warranty is three years of standard and that includes the batteries, but there are extended options available. And we use just the same procedures for warranty claims and so on as we do with our traditional trucks. Now, of course, there is some training required for the use of the vehicle, but in, to all intents and purposes for the driver and crew, it's that you shouldn't touch the orange cables and connectors and treat it just as any other vehicle. But for workshops and maintenance, there are special requirements and training and we also offer a safety kit and there are links to the safety kit from our website. We have our standard DE Connect telematics on the vehicle but there are also telematics to the battery monitoring system and that can be linked in to camera systems and DVR recording and so on and We've also developed systems where it can show you the state of charge of the battery live on the vehicle. Now, of course, there are, there are no tailpipe emissions. It's half as loud when packing, quieter when idling and compacting. And the, the drive-by noise level is actually 60 dBA. Uh, the traditional diesel vehicle is 80 dBA. And just some examples there, a lawnmower, lawnmower normally would be about 90 dBA and a diesel refuse collection vehicle when compacting normally is around 100 dBA. So it is a marked difference. It's much more pleasant to work around the vehicle than for a diesel vehicle. We have been asked about power consumption and we've done lots of trials with the vehicles. And of course, we've now got, uh, I think it's close to 20 customer vehicles out in the field now. This was from last year where we were doing trials with the demo vehicle where it did two collection rounds in the day. It collected over 20 tonnes of waste and went back to the depot with a 29% state of charge and used around 213 kilowatt hour of energy. And this uh, is one this year in the uh, Cheshire area. And this, the vehicle did over 94 miles. It only collected around 13 tons of waste. Uh, and of course, some of that could have been recyclables, but it still got back to the depot with a 15% state of charge and used just under 270 kilowatt hour of energy. So there was a good power reserve left for getting back to the depot. This is quite a busy slide, but uh, this is where we've been tracking our demo vehicles and the average power consumption was 148 kilowatt hour per day. So there is a good margin of uh, safety there for getting back to base. And again, you can see that the payload uh, the maximum we've achieved is 11.6 tonnes on the vehicle, 
during that uh, trial period. And the average was 7.882 on the first collection round. But in some cases, we have done three collection rounds. Now, of course, we have got customer vehicles out in the field now, and uh, Jack Barrett from Nottingham City will be talking about their experiences, but we are seeing that uh, the, the take up has been quite popular and we're already starting to see repeat orders come through for new vehicles where they've been piloting trials in their authorities. And of course, we've been pushing to uh, get the plug-in grant funding for the vehicles for some time now, working with Low Carbon Vehicle Partnership in particular. And we did some trials in Milbrook Proving Grounds in February, and here you can see the results. Uh, so the vehicles performed as they should. In the collection round phase, there were three cycles, and in the HGV round, there were two cycles which of course had no collection or bin lifting. And you can see there that the theoretical range based on their calculations is 80 miles. And of course we've done far more than that while collecting waste. And for an HGV mode, it would be 115 miles. And again, you can see the energy consumed was still considerably below what they consider the usable capacity of about 270 kilowatts against a total of 300 kilowatt hour within the batteries. Again, this is a, a summary of those findings and at the top, our theoretical, try that again, theoretical range for the vehicle is about 154 kilometer based on the, the trials we've been doing. Um, the combined HGV, they had 185 kilometers, and for the RCV, they had 128 kilometers, around 80 miles. So we're well above the requirements for the plugging grant if they do approve the vehicle for that grant funding. So over to you, Hayley, and uh, I think Jack's coming up next. Brilliant. Thank, thank you, Andy. That's great. If you can just pop your microphone on mute. Um, OK, so next up, we've got Jack Barrett, who's the ULEV Grant Project Officer at Nottingham City Council. He's valiantly stepped up on behalf of a colleague who was unable to attend this morning. Um, so over to you, Jack. Thank you very much. Um, do we just want to check that you can see my slides? Yeah, that looks like it's working fine, Jack. Yeah. Brilliant, thank you. Uh, yeah, so good morning, everyone. It's uh, great to be here. I hope you're all keeping well and uh, enjoying that extra bit of freedom that we've been given over the past 10 days or so. Uh, as Hayley mentioned, my name is Jack Barrett. I am a ULEV Grant Project Officer at the Innovation and Change Team within Parking Fleet and Transport Services at Nottingham City Council. Uh, as my title suggests, I work on projects that typically focus on ULEVs. Uh, this ranges from helping the council with its own fleet electrification program to working with businesses and other local authorities to help them transition to ultra low or zero emission vehicles too. Uh, I am stepping in for my colleague, Matt Ralph, uh, as you can see on the slide, who is the innovation and change manager. Uh, and he's been leading our fleet electrification strategy over the past five years or so. Uh, it's a shame he couldn't be here. He's a bit more knowledgeable on the electric refuge vehicles than I am. However, I will try my best to sort of fill his shoes uh, and answer any questions that you may have in the Q and A. Um, so there's a bit of an agenda for today's presentation. Uh, obviously, I'm aware that it's focused on electric refuse vehicles. However, following the brilliant presentation Andy's just given, uh, I feel as though uh, I might be a better place to uh, sort of give a brief overview of the council's road to zero and try my best to integrate our experience uh, of electric refuse vehicles uh, sort of where I can. Uh, next slide. So our decarbonisation programme uh, began in 2016, where we first focused our attention on sort of low, uh, low hanging fruit measures that would reduce our fleet emissions. Uh, this included optimising the routes vehicles were taking, uh, researching appropriate fuel additives and purchasing vehicles that adhered to the latest emission standards. Uh, whilst this approach sort of reduced our emissions to an extent, it only took us so far. 
and was never going to make the significant impact that was needed uh, to meet our decarbonisation objectives. Uh, so for us, the obvious next step was to look at replacing our fleet with electric vehicles. Uh, as you can imagine, this was, and to sort of some extent, uh, still is met with some resistance from our operatives who don't believe or necessarily trust that electric vehicles can fulfill the job of their diesel counterparts. Uh, however, we have remained optimistic and to help us counter these arguments, we often use data uh, that we harvest from our telematic systems, uh, such as Dennis Connect, uh, Masternaut Connect and TrackMate. Uh, to give you an example of how this plays out, uh, drivers will often say, you know, uh, ve electric vehicles won't work because we do split shifts or we do nine hour shifts uh, and that batteries uh, simply won't provide the mileage needed uh, to cover our round. Uh, so then what we do is we look at the telematic data of their vehicle, see that, yes, you are using it for nine hours at a time. However, you're only averaging, you know, 35 miles a day and haven't done more than 70 miles in a single day in the past year. Therefore, X electric vehicle uh, sort of would be a suitable replacement for you. Uh, whilst this approach can be quite direct, it is effective. And, you know, we believe that telematics is one of the easiest ways to ensure that uh, decisions are based on facts um, rather than anecdotes. So since we began our electrification program in 2016, uh, we've taken a rapid but very much uh, targeted approach at transitioning our fleet to ULEVs. To begin with, we focused on vehicles uh, that already had competitive ULEV alternatives on the market, such as cars and vans. And then over time, as the technology became cheaper and more readily available, we expanded out to specialist vehicles uh, such as cage tippers, compact sweepers, uh, minibuses, and two OEM ERCVs, which uh, are the e from Dennis Eagle and were the first of the kind to be uh, operational in the UK. Uh, so just to provide some sort of operational data for our e uh, they both do single shifts starting at around 7 a.m. and returning at about midday, one o'clock. Uh, they route the due day is around 30 to 40 miles, and on a good day, uh, the vehicles will come back with around 40% charge left in them. Um, besides that, there is not really that much exciting about them. They simply do the job of their diesel equivalent. Uh, they perform the same, they lift the same, uh, they do about 400 to 500 compacting cycles a shift, uh, yet they save us about 50 quid a day on fuel. Um, in terms of the drivers, they were somewhat apprehensive uh, about the e at first. However, once they got in them and could experience firsthand that they are simply just a refuse truck that's electric, they really start to appreciate the benefits that come with driving electric, uh, the increased torque, the reduced noise pollution, the increased air quality. Uh, they enjoyed them so much that they pretty much didn't want to get out of them. Uh, and they pretty much refused, sorry, to go back to driving a diesel version of their vehicle. Um, and as this, you know, this is a scenario that is replicated across all types of electric vehicles, not just the ERCVs, uh, which I guess is not a bad position uh, to be in going forward. Uh, so as you can see from the slides, we currently have 196 ULEVs in operation, uh, which is around 40% of our fleet. Uh, this is a transition which seen our carbon output reduced by well over 400 tonnes per annum and will create a reduction of over 3,100 tonnes of carbon over the vehicle's lifetimes. Um, going forward, our aim is to increase our share of ULEVs in the fleet to 100% by 2028, uh, which is in line with the wider carbon ne uh, neutral goal set by the Council. Uh, however, there is a series of barriers which need to be addressed before this can happen, uh, mainly with, you know, with advancements in technology uh, and the ability to free up capital. Um, so yeah, continuing on that theme of barriers, uh, getting to the stage we are currently at uh, wasn't without its fair share of roadblocks along the way. Uh, one of the key roadblocks we had to navigate was uh, electric vehicle maintenance, which is a sort of completely different beast compared to combustion-based vehicles. Uh, from our experience, we found the main dealers are often the only option for electric vehicle owners looking to maintain their vehicles, uh, meaning that some dealers can charge a premium for maintenance, even though, you know, generally speaking, electric vehicles can be cheaper uh, and easier to work with. Um, stemming from this, we decided to create our own ULEV garage called NEVS, uh, which stands for Nottingham Electric Vehicle Services. Uh, NEVS is the first local authority managed ULEV only garage in the UK. We use it to service all of our vehicles, or all of our ULEV, sorry, under 7.5 tonnes, as well as the city's hybrid electric taxis. And we recently opened our uh, doors to the wider public too. It's a process that took us a couple of years to complete and required us to reskill uh, some of our mechanics to IMI level three and four, and we now call them technicians. Uh, this did produce some reticence amongst the uh, mechanics due to it being a new skill that's somewhat more dangerous. However, we found this sort of quickly subsided, especially in the younger age bracket, once they realized that electric vehicles uh, are generally more pleasant and less dirty to work with uh, when done so in a safe environment. Uh, in terms of our e collects we don't currently maintain these in-house uh, as we haven't had them all that long. We don't really have the safe space to do it and we haven't yet put a training program together uh, to do it. However, you know, this is something we are working towards going forward uh, 
and especially as you know we have to transition more of our fleet um, to electric. Um, so another sort of key roadblock which we had to navigate was charging infrastructure, uh, especially at one of our uh, old, older sites, East Cross Depot, uh, which sits on an old Victorian site. Uh, many of the buildings there uh, still use the original infrastructure that was put in place uh, at the time, which limits our low capacity. Um, despite this, we've still managed to install sort of enough infrastructure to power 100 vehicles, including space for a high voltage charger for our 2E RTVs. Uh, to do this, we had to take a rather ad hoc approach towards load and bay management. Uh, for example, we, uh, we limit our charging power output during peak hours. Uh, we use electricity from one building to power the charge points in another building. We charge ER, uh, ERCVs one at a time. Um, you know, we've implemented charging bays and not parking bays. And these are all sort of individual measures that when put together collectively, uh, create quite a comprehensive strategy that helps us sustain sort of charging infrastructure uh, under tight parameters. Um, this said, there will always be a cutoff uh, limit to the sort of low capacity, and which is why sort of a Woolsthorpe depot, uh, we've just installed a new substation to allow us to increase our charge point capacity uh, by 40. Uh, so moving forward, there is a range of other projects that NCC are working on uh, that will tie in with our fleet electrification process. Uh, we've recently been awarded funding to install 40 vehicle, vehicle to grid charging units alongside a large battery storage unit. I'm not actually working on this project myself, but I believe it will utilize batteries uh, sort of from old cars and old uh, RCVs. Um, the aim of this being is to, you know, to store energy from the grid at periods of low price, which we can then use in the day when energy prices are higher to charge some of our vehicles or power parts of our buildings. And, you know, furthering this in the future, we hope to connect this system to a solar PV canopy to essentially create a microgrid uh, that will reduce our reliance on the main grid. Um, these are all sort of future projects and this along with the e-mobility center and our autonomous scrubber um, just sort of form a part of a long-term ambition uh, to create what we call a depot of the future. Um, and finally, just to sort of end uh, with a quick overview of one of our most recent projects, uh, and it's something I'm actually quite well involved with, is our ULEV and hybrid vehicle framework. Uh, the framework is free to access uh, and was put together to help public authorities procure sustainable transport for their fleet. Uh, now, unfortunately, it doesn't cover electric refuse vehicles. However, it does provide access, you know, to electric and hybrid cars, panel vans and chassis cabs, up to 7.5 tonnes, as well as electric uh, compact sweepers, minibuses and taxis. The vehicles in the framework are ones we use in our own fleet, uh, and there's an option to procure the vehicles either by direct award, uh, using our predefined specifications or to your own specification uh, through a further competition. Uh, aside from providing users with just a simple route to market, the framework also gives access to a range of other services, uh, including a mini fleet review, uh, real world data from our own fleet, advice and a guidance on sort of building a solid business case and access to our M&E team who can advise and sort of even install um, charge points for you. Um, as I just mentioned, the framework is relatively new. Uh, we are already currently engaged with 30 public authorities sort of up and down the country. However, we have plenty of capacity uh, to have further discussions. So if it's something any of you uh, would be interested in, uh, yeah, feel free to get in touch. Uh, and on that note, that is my last slide, or should I should say Matt's last slide. Uh, so yeah, thank you for listening to the presentation. Uh, there is some contact details available on the slide uh, from my colleague Matt, who'll be happy to answer sort of any, any of your queries related to the electric refuse vehicles. Uh, that said, if you would like to discuss anything with me, uh, drop a comment in the chat and I would uh, happy to provide you with my contact details. Uh, yeah, thank you for listening and back over to you, Hayley. Thank you, Jack, that's great, thanks for that. Perfect, and our final speaker for the morning is going to be Brian Robinson, Commercial Vehicle Emissions Consultant at Zemo Partnership, who's going to be looking through some of the wider testing and trials taking place around sustainable fuels and touching on a little bit of the, um, the future of the plug-in um, plug plug vehicle grant. Okay, thanks, Brian. Over to you. Yep, yeah, thanks, uh, uh, Hayley, and uh, good, good morning, everybody. Uh, yeah, so um, uh, obviously, we, as Andy mentioned, we've been um, closely involved with the um, uh, uh, electric uh, RCV uh, testing and, and development, uh, and indeed heavily involved over the years with um, uh, developing a test cycle for, uh, for RCVs. I'm going to talk today uh, a little bit more about the sort of uh, the other shorter term options, um, recognising that um, unfortunately not everyone can um, wave a magic wand and transform their fleet to a fully electric um, to fully electric vehicles uh, overnight. So this, this today I'm going to talk about what, what, what else can you do in, in the meantime with the vehicles you've, you've already got. 
um, before you can get to that um, that, that panacea. But, but first, uh, briefly, uh, Zemo, for those of you who have not, not heard of us, uh, we were until uh, a couple of months ago the Low Carbon Vehicle Partnership and had been under that guise for, uh, for many years. Um, Zemo doesn't stand for anything, but if you link it to, uh, you know, think of zero emission mobility, you're, you're not going to be too far off. Um, we are, uh, consist of uh, members, we're part funded by government, by DFT, uh, so we're a, a key partner of uh, DFT and the Office for Zero Emission Vehicles and uh, DEFRA and others involved in this space. Um, but we also rely, of course, on our on support from our, our members who come from all sorts of different um, uh, companies, uh, vehicle manufacturers, technology developers, consultants, and of course, many public sector organisations uh, as well involved in the, in the Zemo family. Uh, I'm going to try and touch on uh, three things. One, uh, some work that was uh, has been going on for a few uh, recent years, uh, but we published um, uh, back end of last year. So if there, anyone who hasn't seen um, that, I'll, I'll, I'll refer to some, some trials that did involve uh, a particular technology application for a refuse collection vehicle. So I'll, I'll describe the results from that. Uh, I'll talk a little bit about um, recent work we've been doing on the broader subject of renewable fuels and how they could apply to um, heavy vehicles, including refuse vehicles. Uh, and then finally, I'll touch on uh, some, some ongoing work. So this is a current project uh, looking at revisions to the um, test protocols for uh, plug-in truck grant as relevant to RCVs. So left program, uh, 32 million pound, 20 million of public money, and about 12 million uh, support from uh, private sector in involved in the, in the trials. Uh, overall, there were eight consortia involved in the trials, um, trialing a range of different technologies from fully electric, um, smaller vehicles, vans, and uh, small small HGVs with fully electric, some range extenders, uh, aerodynamics, lightweight trailers, uh, various gas, uh, methane powered vehicles, uh, and some hydrogen, combustion hydrogen, diesel, dual fuel technologies, which I'll talk about more in a, in a moment. Uh, and our role really was to work with uh, Innovate UK, who provided the overall funding and sort of overall management of the programme, uh, particularly on the uh, testing uh, phase. Uh, that was the government's objectives in doing these, these trials. Uh, and they, they consisted of two, uh, two um, distinct but complementary elements, really. W one from the point of view of operations, making sure that um, the technologies were evaluated in realistic, um, in, in, indeed entirely real, real world, um, situation so they were out on on the road being used by real freight or um, operating companies uh, doing real things day in day out for months uh, weeks months or or indeed um, over a year in some cases and being evaluated and, and monitored in terms of their fuel consumption and other uh, impacts um, and that was backed up by uh, use of uh, fully apples with apples comparisons in laboratory based testing uh, uh, at um, Millbrook Proving Ground, uh, where a test vehicle, uh, a trial vehicle, uh, could be brought in and compared with uh, an, an otherwise exactly identical um, diesel, usually Euro 6 vehicle, doing exactly the same task over exactly the same journeys at exactly the same speeds. So, so we could get a, a, a full um, direct light for light comparison between the incumbent diesel Euro 6 technologies and the, the new new versions. Um, various uh, technologies in the trials, the highlighted one there in uh, light blue or whatever colour that is, I'm colour blind so um, not light blue, forgive me, but it's something like that. Uh, in the middle there is the is the RCV vehicle, so I'll come on to that a little bit more detail in it in a moment, uh, but a range of different, as I've mentioned, uh, gas powered, uh, dual fuel, battery electric, um, and some other um, sort of uh, efficiency improvements like weighting and aerodynamics uh, as well also in this um, quite wide-ranging set of trials uh, and essentially what we've done with the results from all of those assessments uh, in all of those different technologies is split them into broadly three categories um, uh, battery electric are clearly the, the sort of um, the overachievers, the high performers, if you like, in terms of the revolution technologies, these are the ones that um, really do have substantial air quality benefits, of course, there's no tailpipe. Um, and uh, even on sort of grid average electricity, which of course is decarbonizing very quickly as we as we speak, um, will deliver very large, um, uh, this is well to wheel, 
of WTW. So overall greenhouse gas emissions, um, not just nothing coming out of the tailpipe, but actually um, no, nothing much also in the production of the electricity in the first place. So that, that, those are the star performers. Then we had a bunch of technologies that we call transition technologies uh, that could be close to, or in some cases even um, in some respects slightly better than uh, the revolution technologies, um, but also could be, um, depending on how they're applied, uh, not so good. So these are generally the, uh, the dual fuel vehicles, the gas powered vehicles, and the range extended vehicle, of course, much like a plug-in hybrid car. Um, its overall environmental benefit will depend how much time it spends in electric mode and how much time it spends with the combustion engine working. Um, so you, you can read this for yourself, but generally speaking, um, if you're not careful about where you get your energy from, whether that's your gas or your hydrogen um, or your indeed your diesel, although that wasn't part of the trials, um, you could end up with either quite modest greenhouse gas savings or, or indeed no greenhouse gas savings at all in the, in the most extreme cases. Um, but similarly, if you're careful where you source your energy from and make sure that's renewable, um, then you can uh, uh, open up quite large greenhouse gas savings uh, up to around 90% in some cases. Um, but because they've all got combustion engines, um, then typically they're operating at um, uh, Euro 6 kind of levels. Um, so no major significant improvements. They might be slightly better in some respects, but they're quite likely to be slightly worse in other respects. So overall, um, horses for courses on air quality. And finally, the, the evolution technologies are the, the, the ever little bit helps type um, approaches, uh, aerodynamics, uh, light weighting, that, that kind of stuff, which will inevitably only save a small amount of fuel, but that's not insignificant. That's still a, a useful thing to do, um, but no direct air quality benefits because you're not doing anything with the fundamentals of the combustion uh, engine, diesel, diesel engine combustion. Uh, so this is, uh, apologies, also, this is also quite a busy slide, um, but this is um, uh, some of the key findings from the uh, hydrogen dual fuel refuse collection vehicles uh, trial. There were two of those uh, within the trials. Uh, interestingly, one was a Euro 5 and one was a Euro 6. So the, the way this technology works is effectively a retrofit. So you take an existing vehicle uh, and a company called uh, Ulemco who do this um, technology, uh, then apply, uh, add some hydrogen tanks, um, modify the uh, combustion uh, map uh, and apply some you know, clever software and ECU and what have you um, and they will dose in hydrogen uh, into the diesel combustion chamber uh, and thus displace uh, diesel in, in the process so the, uh, the converted vehicle will burn less diesel and replace that lost diesel with hydrogen uh, to achieve the same uh, net result at the wheels. Um, so this uh, is the overall summary of re results um, uh, from the left trials, from the emissions testing in particular. Um, probably the two or three interesting points to point out here. Uh, so this number, the 81 compared to 97, or the 92 compared to 106, gives you an indication of how much less diesel was being used by the converted vehicle to that same vehicle just running in diesel only mode. So that's the same as if it was unconverted that's effectively the same as a diesel vehicle um, and they're about 15 to 20 percent lower so that's the kind of displacement rate achieved in the trials um, the obviously tailpipe co2 goes down because you're burning 20 percent 15 to 20 percent less diesel and replacing that with hydrogen which when combusted just produces water vapor so the tailpipe emissions inevitably go down by 15 20 percent um, but this is the, the point I was making earlier about it's important to work out where the hydrogen comes from. Um, actually, in the trials, the hydrogen was produced uh, almost all of it, 96% up there in the bullet points, uh, it did come from renewable electricity, uh, electrolysis. So it would have been more like this, um, these savings here of 7 to 11%. Um, but if you're not careful where your hydrogen comes from and you new, use steam methane ref reformation of natural gas, uh, actually, you put the greenhouse gas impacts up. Uh, because that form of hydrogen is actually very high carbon, effectively, very high carbon impacts to produce that hydrogen. Um, the, the other things worth uh, noting, I think, here are, you know, going, going back to basics a, a bit, you know, we're talking about transition to electric RCVs, uh, just going from a Euro 5 to a Euro 6, uh, from an air quality point of view, is a massive improvement. So if you've got, if anyone listening on the call has still got Euro 5 RCVs, um, 
please, uh, if you can't go straight to an electric, please at least go to, to Euro sixes. These are sort of 96, 98% reductions in pollutant emissions of NOx and pot particle number, uh, just by virtue of having a Euro six vehicle, which is this top line versus the Euro five baseline, which is, which is down here. Um, so moving on. Uh, renewable fuels. Uh, it's the second of my three uh, quick topics to talk about. I'm going to focus on a couple of issues here. Uh, renewable fuels guide that we published uh, last year. Um, I'll um, show a brief slide summarising some of the findings from uh, all the information contained within that. Uh, and much more recently, within the last few weeks, we've also launched a thing called the Renewable Fuel Assurance Scheme. Uh, and hopefully that will be of interest. So I'll, I'll give a little bit of detail on that uh, as well. Uh, so landscape for renewable uh, HGVs, uh, heavy vehicle fuels in the in the UK, um, probably the ones of most interest, I think most relevance to existing RCV users. So if you've already got uh, whether it's a Euro 5 or a Euro 6 RCV in your fleet, uh, what can you do rather than just use um, standard diesel fuel? Uh, well, the, the, from a greenhouse gas point of view the, uh, the, and um, vehicle compatibility point of view, the obvious one there is hydro treated vegetable oil, uh, slightly higher cost, uh, availability may be a challenge, um, but if you can get hold of it at a reasonable cost, and, and uh, I know some people have, have, can, can, have managed to do that, so it, it can be done, um, then that's a direct drop in replacement for, you don't have to do anything with the vehicle, it will run just as if you were running on normal diesel fuel um, and achieve something like 90 to 92% um, savings in greenhouse, greenhouse gas emissions. Um, when doing anything for air quality, of course, it's, it's still basically a, a diesel fuel running in a diesel engine. Uh, the other option uh, with uh, diesel vehicles is, is high blend um, uh, fame, fatty acids, acid, methyl ester, biofuels, sort of more traditional uh, biofuel, diesel biofuels, biodiesel. Um, blends of over 20% uh, are possible. B100 is quite challenging because you probably need to um, uh, adapt the vehicle for, for that sort of high blend. B20 certainly to B30 uh, is generally um, quite quite possible. Um, uh, again, costs can be a slight issue. It probably wouldn't be a huge amount of different cost per litre to uh, to standard diesel, um, but you'll get a saving depending on how high a blend. So at the 20% uh, blend, you might get an 18% greenhouse gas reduction, for example. Similarly, if you were able to run at B100 you get perhaps an 85 percent reduction in greenhouse gas emissions uh, the other main fuel for in this sector is probably biomethane for those of you that are running gas powered um, rcvs uh, clearly if you've got a gas powered rcv then absolutely run it on biomethane rather than um, fossil methane natural gas uh, and you will achieve very big savings 82 to 85 percent uh, greenhouse gas savings um, overall recommendation though from uh, other tests within the left program and other work we've done is that gas isn't really suited to that sort of application it's it's sweet spot is very high mileage you know, um, high steady speed cruising type operations long haul trucks is where gas works best it's not really suited to very low speed transient operation because of the efficiency losses um, in moving from a compression ignition diesel engine to a spark ignition uh, engine for, for dedicated gas so um, that's the general uh, the, these two here not so relevant immediately obviously you'd need to do the retrofitting or I've talked about hydrogen in terms of uh, uh, dual fuel uh, and, and bio LPG not really relevant to uh, to RCVs. Um, renewable fuel assurance scheme this is the thing uh, just launched by a colleague of mine um, in uh, Zemo partnership over the last uh, month or so so more details available uh, via the, uh, the website Google RFAS and you'll, you, you should find it uh, essentially what this is aiming to do is to provide uh, operators with greater level of certainty and reassurance that any renewable fuel they think they're buying uh, generally is uh, renewable and sustainable comes from um, uh, uh, non-damaging uh, feedstocks, you know, sustainable feedstocks, um, meets the greenhouse gas emissions uh, thresholds contained within the RTFO, which is the Renewable Transport Fuel Obligation. So that's the official government scheme to incentivize uh, and pull through renewable fuels into the transport sector. Um, so look, look that up if you're interested, talk to your fuel supplier, Make sure they're um, they're signed up to this to this scheme. 
And finishing off, right, got a few minutes, hi Hayley. Uh, plug-in truck grant uh, proposals, finally. Um, so yeah, the plug-in truck grant was originally introduced back in, I think it was back in 2016 for, um, for heavy vehicles. Uh, at that time, um, there wasn't a standard test process for refuse collection vehicles, so they were specifically excluded uh, from, from testing. Um, in the intervening period, um, thanks particularly to funding from uh, TFL, I don't know if anyone from TFL is on the call, but thank you to TFL, uh, they funded um, Low Carbon Vehicle Partnership to develop a refuse collection vehicle test cycle uh, back in, I think it was 2017, maybe 2018. Uh, so we now do have a nationally recognised standard cycle. It's used in the Clean Vehicle Retrofit Accreditation Scheme. Uh, it was also used, of course, for the low emission freight trials that I mentioned uh, earlier. So we can bring a, a standard RCV cycle that includes bin lifting and compaction uh, into this, this framework. Uh, there were also some recent changes announced by OZEV, the Office for Zero Emission Vehicles. Um, you may have heard about the obviously the changes to the plug-in car grant and the and the uh, cap values and also changes to vans uh, and some changes to HGVs are actually a mixed picture of HGVs in that um, for some uh, vehicles, particularly the heavier ones, including RCVs, if the grant becomes um, available to them, uh, it actually went up from 20,000 to 25,000 uh, in the most recent set of uh, announcements. So that's uh, uh, that was good news, at least from for, for that sector. Um, RCBs, as I say, were specifically excluded from the testing, and there was also a 50 mile per hour minimum speed capability limit imposed um, for any plug in grant eligibility. Uh, and that, of course, can be quite challenging for some uh, RCBs in particular. They very rarely need to do anything like that speed, so uh, some of them can't, um, which would, would have made them, in, in, or does currently make them, ineligible. Uh, so what are we proposing to change? I should emphasize these are proposals that we will make to the Office for Zero Emission Vehicles. I cannot guarantee they will be accepted and indeed they will need to be approved by their ministers, overlords. So um, uh, this, this is on our, our, our wish list rather than any um, uh, definite plans to implement, but we would hope uh, these would be implemented reasonably soon. Uh, certainly adding, of course, a specific RCB category, bringing in the, uh, the test process and reducing the minimum speed capability to something perhaps more reasonable, 40 miles an hour, uh, would be sensible. Uh, on the wider truck front, the rider HGV front, splitting the different weight categories so we can apply different, slightly different requirements and uh, reflecting the different duty cycles of these sorts of um, broad categories of vehicles. Uh, we want to simplify the testing, make that easier for companies like Dennis Eagle uh, to, to, to do the testing without being any less robust and realistic in terms of the uh, overall range estimates and energy consumption that um, uh, the testing uh, uh, produces. Um, and of course, we need to look specifically at the range extenders. They um, were originally only required to do 10 miles on zero emissions, um, but now they also have to do 60 miles on, on uh, zero emission. So we need to look at the how we test that and how we assess. Uh, there's a 50% greenhouse gas tailpipe um, emissions requirement for, for those sorts of vehicles. Uh, and of course, um, just like a plug-in hybrid car, as mentioned earlier, um, whether you get a 50% saving or not depends entirely on what kind of journey distance you're, you're assessing it over. If you're doing a quite short journey where most of the time you're on electric or in battery mode, then you'll get a very big tailpipe saving. If you're doing a very long journey, where the battery runs out uh, early on um, and you're in internal combustion engine mode most of the time, then you will get a much smaller saving. So getting that average daily journey right or the assessed daily journey right is, is a key part of that, that work. Uh, and that's it from uh, him, hopefully reasonably on time, Hayley, and um, look forward to any questions and, and discussion. Perfect. Thank you, Brian. No, that's great. If I can ask our other speakers to pop their cameras and mics back on as well, and we'll all appear on your screens. Brilliant. We're all there now. Great. We've got 
a lot of questions coming through from the audience today, which is great stuff. Um, just to let everybody know that obviously we'll go through as many questions as we can. There's some key themes coming through. But if, if, you, if you've asked a question and it doesn't get answered today, don't worry, because we'll we'll get that done for you online, uh, offline, sorry, and we'll get the answers out to you after the webinar. Um, and just to remind everyone again that um, if you came in late to the to the webinar or if you've had to, you know, if you had to shoot off early or you had any issues, then it will be available to watch on demand on freightinthecity.com um, from tomorrow. So, so log on then, you can view back the presentations and, and watch the webinar again. Right, okay, so questions, lots of questions. Um, start with, if we start off with one of the, sort of one of the obvious um, things that always comes up when we look at new technology and that's costs, um, the, the sort of upfront costs, total, total cost of ownership, whole life costs. Um, if I sort of, Put, put, the, put the question out then and maybe come to each of you and, and get your take on it that would be great so obviously total cost of ownership um, is very important when looking at any new technology a couple of things were being asked um, several times are there any price comparisons with traditional diesels available for people to look at um, and also um, how you know how would how would another local authority going about go about assessing the whole life costs for a new electric bin lorry so perhaps if we come to you Andy first of all on, on that one sure um, it does depend on specification but you are talking about roughly twice the cost of a traditional diesel vehicle as a complete vehicle with body bin lift and so on. Um, in terms of the sort of payback, we think it's about seven to eight years where effectively you should break even. But of course, it does depend on the duty cycle and the usage. Um, Jack mentioned the fact that they were saving about 50 pounds on uh, diesel costs. And I've seen there are several questions about the, the cost of charging. It does depend on the rate you're paying for your electricity. At the standard rate of about 14 pence per kilowatt hour, if you're using 250 kilowatt hours for your collection, then you'll pay about 35 pounds for that power to recharge the vehicle. If you took it that you were using about 97 litres of fuel a day for 100 kilometres, which I think was the figure from Zemo's chart, then you'd probably be paying around 100 pounds a day for your fuel. So there's definitely savings there on the fuel, but it does depend how you utilise the vehicle, how many rounds you do a day and so on. But as I said, we've already got customers coming back to us ordering more vehicles. So the vehicles work, they do everything a diesel vehicle will do, and they see that long term, it, the benefits certainly are there to make it worthwhile. Brilliant. Thank you, Andy. Jack, yeah. what, what's your thoughts on that? How, how, how did Nottingham go about looking at the business case for, for the e-collect? Or in uh, fact, other, other electric vehicles as well, because I imagine you'd have to use the same process no matter what size vehicle you're yeah, looking at. We've We've, uh, we're quite good at getting grant funding, I think, which helps along the way. Uh, obviously, as Andy mentioned, the, the RCVs can be a bit dearer compared to the diesel, com co uh, the diesel counterparts. Um, yeah, you do get a big saving in terms of operational costs, and it's about reinvesting that, I think, uh, to fund other EVs and to sort of, yeah, fund that gap between the price of a diesel and an electric. In terms of actual figures on cost savings, I don't, I don't have any on me. I wouldn't be able to give you a figure off the top of my head. Um, but uh, yeah, I would be able to look into that and sort of provide some more detail on our own experience of, of the data we have. Is, the gu is, that sort of, is that the sort of guidance that people might be able to pick up from the framework um, uh, package that you guys have put together as well? We, some sort of guidance on how to, look, how, to, how to cost it for themselves? Yeah, in terms of other vehicles, definitely so. Uh, we don't, obviously the refuse vehicles aren't available for our framework, um, but in terms of other vehicles and going electric, yes, absolutely, we can, we can help out with business cases and sort of um, provide, use our data to help figure out yeah, your, your business case and apply it to your circumstances of how many vehicles, how many miles your vehicles travel, how much fuel they use, uh, general maintenance costs, and compare it to our figures and try and give you some savings, really, and okay. uh, work out if they, they would pay back over the lifespan. 
Okay, thank you. And Brian, is is um a sort of whole life costing of diff of di you know of a different range of vehicles? Is that something that CMO Partnership has, has probably yeah, done the exercise yeah. over the years? Uh, is there something available for people to look at? Yeah, yeah. I'm um, not sure if there's something available. I can I'm looking into that and certainly forward you any 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 links in terms of what we've we've published. Certainly, it's a very live area of uh, of activity and and thought. And we're doing lots of work on the um, electric vehicle infrastructure piece uh, because that, that's the key part of the jigsaw i think to to understand whether that payback is uh, is seven years or three years or or yeah. 20 years kind of thing is how much you have to pay for the charging infrastructure uh, on top of uh, clearly as andy says the the in use savings in terms of per mile diesel versus electricity will be massive so certainly with the electric yeah. in the left trials typically 70 or 80 percent you know daily use um uh, savings uh, by switching from diesel to, to electric and of course lower maintenance costs as well um, and lower um, potential future charges around as we go from low emission zones potentially into zero emission zones and all this kind of stuff so the, the, there's potentially quite a healthy business case on a day-to-day -day basis uh, as I say the uh, the caveat to that is the infrastructure um, and, and I think the uh, the key point there is for RCVs and, and Andy may from his data may be able to tell us what the sort of average the average sort of dwell time is uh, between the end of a shift one day and the start the following day and so how long does an rcb spend parked overnight uh, because that's probably 10 or 12 hours uh, and in which case you only would need a 22 kilowatt charger to to fully recharge overnight um, so the more you can get away with having low power charging and not go over your site's existing capacity um, uh, the cheaper it will be effectively if you can just plug it in already <laughs> at 20, yeah. to, to 20 kilowatts um, then jobs are good and, um, if you've got to upgrade your your grid connection or put in higher power chargers then it starts to potentially become much more expensive uh, and then there's a capsule uh, payback period to, to, uh, to factor in as well but um, yeah so I, th I think RCVs are are right they're certainly one of the lower lower of the lowest hanging fruits for yeah. electrification for that partly for that reason Okay, thank you. Did you want to just um, add on that, Andy? Did you uh, just from from the customers you've already got out there? Do you do you have um, what's their experience with charging infrastructure? Would you say? Um, certainly, with some of the older properties, there have been issues where we've the the charger we use, the mobile charger, you can turn down the power rating, and we've had to do that so that the supply system doesn't trip out. But once you get the the setup established, then um, generally it's around seven to eight hours to charge on the 50 kilowatt hour system and about nine to 10 hours on a 32 amp system, which probably would be at about 22 kilowatts charge rate. So okay. it's certainly yeah. achievable, yeah. Yeah, okay, thank you. Um, if we stick on stick on charging and batteries, if we can, there's another another key theme that's been coming through. Lots of questions around the battery. So, um, first one, lifespan. When you say you know the, the whole life of a battery, what what short what are you looking at? Are you thinking sort of seven years, typical RCV, twelve years, HG? What what what's your what what do you base it on? It, it's based on about seven to eight years, yeah. but most of our customers operate the vehicles for longer, though they may not be a frontline vehicle for all of the, say, 10 years it operates for. Um, but for the batteries, they are the Nissan Leaf type battery. As far as we're concerned, they could have a second life after they've been used for a refuse vehicle. They could be used in a power bank to charge vehicles or emergency power for schools or hospitals. And there are already companies in place who are using older batteries for that type of application. That's right. I think it's quite a few projects. Yeah. 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 That's interesting, isn't it? The secondary use of batteries. Yeah. I think we'll see more of that developing, won't we, as we go yeah. on. Um, and also around the batteries as well. Um, do you, what sort of warranty um, do you guys offer for? But is it is it covered in the life the same as the truck warranty, or is it a separate type of warranty for a battery? At the moment, it's within, and of course, it's still early days. But within that three year warranty, they are cab covered, and it is possible to buy an extended warranty. Um, it is early days, but then again, those type of batteries have been in use for several years in Nissan cars anyway without too many problems so we don't expect to be there 
any major change in the policy on the, the warranty side of things. Yeah, just to ch chip in there, yeah, our, our experience certainly on the obviously on the car side where there have been various electric vehicles around for many years now is that um, yeah, yes, clearly batteries do degrade, but um, the, the level of degradation is is not as high as was feared some you know, some years ago. Um, so yeah, you will get a drop off in performance gradually, but it is very gradual uh, and not. Um, not major, certainly if you're talking seven or eight years. Yeah, certainly not within the lifespan of an average RCV. Yeah, okay. No. Um, and with regards to the battery range, obviously you've touched on the different cycles that your customers and different authorities have been working on their routes and so on. Um, one of the things that's often mentioned is weather, um, the impact of different extremes of weather. Have you any um, results around, you know, for example, how uh, how the eclect might perform in a very on a very cold day when the lights are on, heat is on, everything like that? Yeah, yeah, we did climate changing as part of the oh, okay. testing for the vehicle, both whole vehicle type approval and also the, the durability and functioning test um i can't remember the figure it, figure it went down to i can't remember if it was minus 10 or minus 15 and up to 50 degrees i think it was and it performed without any major change certainly i think below zero there is a slight degradation but it it's not enough to cause a major problem you know it's a couple of percent yeah in terms of I, I know sandy the um uh, the graphs you showed of in-service performance were based around November and December. Yeah. Because, and, and the testing you did at Millbrook, was that in February? That was in February, and it was quite cold there. It wasn't too warm in February, was it? No. Yeah. yeah. Um, we're not so sure above 50 degrees. I did see it. There was a question there about use in Nigeria. I'm sure it will be available at some time for hotter climbs, but at the moment... Um, the testing really has been on European lines. Yeah. Okay, no, thank you. Yeah. And um, around again, around range and operational duty, um, Jack, there's been a few questions around um, the actual sorts of routes that the vehicles are being used on. Do you, do you have an average idea of how many um, pickups, waste collections are done on each route? Um, I think we do about 1,200 um, bin, bin, sort of bin collections, uh, bin yeah. pickups. Uh, on an average route and across our 30 to sort of 40 miles. Um, but yeah, it works perfectly fine. As sort of going back to the weather thing, we had no issues over the winter. Yeah. Uh, it still did the exact same job that we needed it to do. Um, yeah, still compacted the same amount as it usually does. Yeah. The routes the routes that you guys have been using, are they a mixture of residential and trade routes? Yeah, well? it's all city. Uh, we're, we're city based, so it's very urban. Um, yeah. yeah, it's just very hilly. We optimize our routes to try and get enough sort of battery back from the braking systems um, and that sort of thing. Yeah. Okay, and looking at um, one, of the, one of the other key themes that's been coming out today um, is that there's quite a lot of questions around maintenance and testing I've seen. So um, firstly, are there any extra MOT requirements required or any, anything like that that's needed for, a, for an electric vehicle? Not that I'm aware because of course the original testing for our vehicle approval covers the uh, crash testing, the safety testing and so on, reg 100 for the batteries. Um, so they'd already be looking for security of systems for any damage to equipment, uh, damage to cabling and so on. So I don't think there's anything really additional as such. Yeah. But of course, it is new territory for yeah. a lot of workshops and test facilities. But yeah. um, we've, we've not so far seen any, yeah. any issues okay. that have arisen. And, and touching on that, I mean, Jack, obviously you guys have set up your NEVs. Is that right? NEVS yeah, um, workshop. Right. I think that's a great idea. Sort of a ULEV only maintenance workshop. That's fabulous. Um, you said you got some training for your technicians. Was that easy to find? Was it, was it sort of specific training you guys put together? Or is it something that any, any workshop could to yeah. conduct skill their technicians to? I think it's something yeah that any any workshop could really do um it was done at a local college imi is the level level threes level four is the highest level and that's classed as a master technician they can really go down into sort of the batteries and start to sort of take them apart and look at the cells um and there is quite a lot of work that goes into sort of getting to that stage um i think level three is is a comfortable standard that allows you to pretty much do everything you need to do maintenance wise uh, on an electric vehicle um, and it's what we sort of push our mechanics towards and um, we also do have a couple of IMI level fours there as well. 
okay all right thank you um, and the other questions around um, maintenance, um, they're, they're quite sp specific, but obviously it's an important one. Um, how, do you wash, how do you wash the vehicles? Can you use an underbody wash system with an electric vehicle? You can, but there are limitations. You shouldn't be using a jet wash directly onto the connectors, for example, within a, a few centimetres. But uh, we, we already know there are vehicles that have gone through washes without any problems there. I think it's IP67 or higher rating, so they should be able to withstand it. But obviously, you shouldn't try to do anything too extreme. Okay. Yeah, our vehicles have no problem on a normal wash, our electric vehicles. Okay, well, that's good. So you actually, yeah, so you've experience of that. Brilliant. Okay. Um, right, so we've got some questions coming in here as well for around um, comparison of the lifespan of the vehicles. Um, someone's asked, for example, to Zemo, have you looked at whole life emissions for, for, for new electric vehicles? For example, can you compare the lifespan with a, with a traditional um, combustion vehicle? Have you done any an analysis around that, Brian? Yeah, that, absolutely. It's a, a key issue, a uh, key area of work uh, for us. So um, uh, the simple answer is jointly join Zemo <laughs> and, you, and you can find out lots more. But, uh, <laughs> Yeah, life cycle assessment. Um, you know, in, in moving first from this obsession that uh, certainly regulatory uh, regulators have had with tailpipe emissions, um, which of course, from a greenhouse gas point of view, is completely irrelevant, um, uh, into a, at least a well to wheel. Also, we factor in where does the fuel come from and what are the emissions associated with getting the energy to the, the vehicle in the first place. But wider than that, out to what about the manufacturing impacts, what about the disposal impacts and, and, and so on, uh, is a key part of activity. I mean, the general, the, the general philosophy with, with heavy vehicles more generally, because they do such large mileages and because they consume so much uh, fuel in terms of whether it's two miles per gallon or nine miles per gallon, um, the in-use impacts always completely swamp anything at the manufacturing stage. So it's always a small proportion uh, of the overall life cycle impacts. Um, I, I guess that's to some extent slightly less true for RCVs because they're doing very low mileage, or generally much lower mileages, of course, than, than more standard trucks. Um, but yeah, so it's a, it is a, a live area of interest um, on uh, in terms of life cycle stuff. There was also a question maybe about uh, HBO and UCO. Do you want me to talk about that? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Got that yeah. on my list. Yeah, go um, for it. I saw, yeah. Yes. Um, uh, so yeah, my understanding is that HBO is a is a complete drop in substitute for diesel. So the, the engine, the vehicle, does not know any difference. Um, so whatever you can do with standard diesel fuel, you can do with HVO, uh, and it's and it won't produce any more um, uh, air quality pollutant emissions than uh, than standard diesel would. Uh, you can use it at any blend you like in any combination you like. Um, that of course doesn't apply to the UCO and the um, those other forms of, of biofuels where it is more challenging, and you do have to manage what kind of blend blend percentages you're you're, you're using. Okay. Uh, on the operational side of things, um, driver experience we've heard has been pretty positive, which is great to hear. Um, do you have to get any specific driver training for your drivers? Over to you, Jack. Um, I think we have, yes, we have gone through specific driver training. Not sure if that was a Dennis Eagle or not, but they have had specific training for the, for the vehicles just because they are different. Andy, do you, do you want to expand on that? Do you guys offer some sort of package for drivers? Wherever we deliver the e-collecting, we do provide training, but it's more the do's and don'ts. Don't touch the orange cables or components. If you get a problem, the safest thing to do is isolate the truck batteries, which turns off all the high voltage systems, um, and get an expert in who's trained to deal with them. But again, the training is rolling out you know, we've got technician, we've got over 70 mobile engineers, they're being trained to use and operate and work on the vehicles. But there are, again, the levels of training that are available. So many of them, they won't be able to go into the battery compartments, but they can deal with the, the components around them. Okay. All right. Thank um, you. Well, just to follow on that, yeah. from that, sorry, um, I believe Dennis Eagle actually trained our trainers who then trained our drivers. I think we had four trained. Who then go on to train the drivers how to drive the vehicles. Yeah. 
okay thank you um noise benefits on the opposite still sticking with operational um benefits so noise benefits um obviously 60 dba that's great that's you know oh. that's that's pretty good i think that's classed as a sort of comes under, under the peak levels doesn't it for uh, yeah it's, the noise, it's normal it? conversation actually yeah dba um we don't need at the moment to add supplementary noise but we are looking at doing it particularly when you're in traffic we have noticed it, it can be an issue people just don't realize the vehicle is moving near them um, and i think that the testing requires a minimum of 32 dba to know that there's a vehicle approaching you okay um, but we are looking at uh, systems that can be added to the vehicle. A sort of safety alert just to let people uh, in the vicinity of the or, vehicle know. Yeah. Or, or to emulate to emulate the noise of a, an engine. Yeah, okay. Maybe a um, Ferrari or... <laughs> That would be good. Um, I mean, does, does, does the silent running give you some opportunities for extended uh, shift times or anything like that, would you say, Jack? Or, or, um, or is just the, the other associated cl clatter that you might get with a bin, bin no, collection? No, our, our drivers actually really like them quiet. Um, you know, they feel less stressed at the end of a shift just because they're not exposed to so much high noise, yeah. uh, you know, for, for hours on end. And we've had no issues um, sort of with them being quiet on, on that front, though. No. But do you uh, think yeah. the residents have noticed? Um, do you think has it been? And they probably have noticed. Thing? I mean, you would probably. It's probably a bit odd seeing a silent truck go <laughs> past, isn't it? Um, but I, I don't. I wouldn't see it as a negative thing. We haven't had any issues on our end from residents finding them silent. No. Okay. Um, right on the e collect itself. Few questions around the model. Firstly, is there a, is there a spec sheet? Um, I'm sure you'd you'd have all the details and the dimensions on your website. You can clarify in a second. But also. Yeah, there are are you looking at some other sizes, some smaller versions in future? We are developing a, a two-axle vehicle. The, the, the three-axle vehicle can be plated to 27 tonnes. There is a, a DVSA derogation to allow it to go up, to operate up to 27 tonnes. So the two-axle vehicle probably will be at 19 tonnes if that derogation is allowed. And of course, that derogation really allows for the installation weight of the batteries and equipment. So if, if you only have a 700 kilogram, kilogram premium, then maybe it would be at 18.7 tonnes. Um, we don't do a wide vehicle at the moment. We've concentrated on a Pareto principle on our biggest selling vehicle, the narrow six by two rear steer. Um, but there are plans to develop a wide track vehicle as well. Not sure when that's going to happen. Okay, thank you. Yeah. Um, and also, are there any trials taking place on split body vehicles? Is another question that's just popped in. Again, they're being looked at, but of course, you've then effectively got two body systems, and it's the range that is going to be affected. Um, but uh, Certainly with the development of batteries and uh, maybe supplementary power supply, that, that is possible, but not just yet. Okay. So if you think a more generic question, so um, obviously you've got Nottingham, you're, you're sort of steaming ahead, aren't you, with your electric fleet with over 190 vehicles. That's brilliant. It's about 40% of your fleet, I think you said. Um, and a lot of local authorities are taking maybe one, two electric RCVs, just sort of dip a toe in the water and try the technology. Question to all of you, really, how far away are we from this becoming the mainstream vehicle for, for uh, re refuse collection? How far away are we? Or are we still at a point where perhaps the cost is a barrier for, for some? Are we, uh, are we talking, you know, a couple of years, five years? What, what, would you, what, what do you all think and what needs to happen for us to get there? I would suggest probably about five years, and it is cost and range that are the, the biggest factors, um, but also the infrastructure. If you're charging two or three vehicles, it's not really a problem. But if you want to charge 20 or 30 vehicles, then it may be that you need a completely new infrastructure or maybe a new substation by your, your depot. Okay. Yeah, I, do, I, do, I think I'd agree with that, um, Hayley. I think, as I said, this is, this is a sort of low-hanging fruit sector for, for electrification to me. Uh, yes, there clearly are challenges 
um, cost and infrastructure being the two key ones. Uh, I mean, one of the questions was around, well, what about fuel cell uh, vehicles and, and fuel cells, heavy duty vehicles? I think maybe a, a, a role for those in, in the future, but it will be around uh, long haul where electrification is, is much more challenging. Um, there seems to be absolutely no point uh, putting a fuel cell hydrogen system in a refuse collection vehicle that's only doing 50 or 60 miles. Why not just put the electricity directly into a battery than waste three times more electricity, turning it into hydrogen and then back into electricity again on the on the vehicle. So I, I don't think fuel cells is a is a viable alternative for refuse collection vehicles. Um, electrification kind of works already, and, and every iteration of the of the technology will get better as it has done with cars over the last decade or so. Um, so I think yeah, certainly five by the end of this decade. In the okay. same way as all, all cars will need to be, um, all new cars will need to be electric or pretty close to it by then. Uh, I would be very disappointed if we're not at a situation where all new RCVs aren't electric by, by in that sort of time frame. A bit longer for bigger trucks, of course, but I think this decade is key for RCVs. Okay. And Jack, what yeah. about yourself? What about Nottingham? When, when do you think you guys might move over fully to electric? Um, yeah, so sort of echoing what, what they've just said about the infrastructure and costs. Uh, we reckon be about 90% in five years' time. Uh, we have just obviously got a two megawatt substation coming this year, and this will allow us to expand our fleet uh, sort of to accommodate for that. Uh, but our goal is 2028. That is when we want to be carbon neutral um, as a city. Um, so that, that will include our fleet as well. And yeah, so hopefully... All of our fleet vehicles will be either electric or definitely ultra low emission. Okay. Um, and for all the local authorities we've got watching today, if I stay with you, Jack, if I can, what, I mean, what would be your top tip for those that haven't trialed any electric vehicles yet? And they think, well, hang on a minute, this looks like an easy, easy thing for me to just get started with, with maybe one vehicle. What would your, what would your top tip be? Um, yeah, probably probably start on the lower end. Start with the cars and the vans. Start with um, the smaller ones. I think, yeah, yeah, they're easier. Just try it. Just get out there and it, you sort of work it out as you go along. Every every case is different. Every site has its own sort of different issues with infrastructure. And yeah, it's just about getting involved really and just sort of getting your ball rolling and you pick it up and sort of learn. But yeah, start start small. I would say uh, with the easier options uh, and just build from there. Okay. Anyone else want to add to that? If someone's just um, thinking for fleet managers just starting out on their electric journey, what would, what would be the first step for them to take? Well, the first thing really is to trial a vehicle. We have two demo vehicles that are out and about. Um, and really, they, they can do everything the diesel vehicle can do. But of course, for longer rural collection rounds, they do maybe need to make sure that they... Uh, do their route planning properly first, because it is a, a big vehicle to recover if, if yeah. you have a problem. Are you confident that the with the rural routes, the you know the the range is such now that that nearly any route could be covered, or are there still a few challenge? I suppose if you up in the well, Highlands, there might be a few challenging areas still. The drivers are bound by uh, the working hours directory, drivers' hours, and so on. So there is a limit to how far they can travel and and be collecting waste. So with the uh, example in Cheshire, you know, 94 miles in the day, they still collected about 13 tonnes of waste. And as far as I'm aware, did everything the diesel vehicle would do. So that is perfectly possible. But if you start going into areas that are very hilly, Cheshire is fairly flat, yeah. really. Yeah. Um, then you've got to consider that, to factor that into your calculations. Yeah. Okay, so Brian, is that where, uh, are, are there any, you know, is, is there also a role for something like a drop-in fuel, an HVO or something to run alongside yeah, so if we, electric yeah, vehicles? Those applications, that might be an answer. And of course, that's where potentially the, uh, the plug-in hybrid range extender type um, you know, interim solution come as battery technology develops and as, you know, weight, weight comes down per kilowatt hour. Um, so that, you know, at the moment, we, we can't get a, a viable 150, 200 mile RCV uh, electric battery, but um, with a battery that can do most of those miles or many of those miles and a, a, a small range extender, whether that's a diesel engine or a gas engine or a petrol engine or a fuel cell, oh yeah, we can do all sorts of things um, to generate the energy as a generator. Um, I think those, those sorts of solutions start to become uh, viable in those applications where you, you were, you, Either you don't have opportunity charging, because that's the other option, of course, if you've got a battery that can only do 100 miles and you need to do 150, 
well, stop after 75 or 80 and, and, and charge it up again. <laughs> uh, and as the high power charging system rolls out for cars, then that starts to become uh, an option, the likes of grid serve, that sort of solution where you've got 350 kilowatt charges, um, you know, that, that starts to become an option for bigger vehicles as well that, that do need that opportunity charging during the day, can't rely on just charging up at a depot overnight. Um, so yeah, the, the crystal ball is a bit, a bit more fuzzy on that issue, but <laughs> options are coming. <laughs> Okay, thank you. And Andy, yeah. just just thinking about the e-collect technology that you've yeah. you've got, are you would you be thinking of rolling that out potentially on the urban safety vehicle? I mean, obviously there's big demand for um, construction vehicles with the with the great direct vision you've got. I mean, would are you looking at other applications for the technology in the future? Um, not in the medium term. In the long term, yes. Yeah. Um, and part of that is more about the capabilities. You know, we're still building diesel vehicles. There will be a phase out and phase in of electric vehicles. At the moment, we, we can build probably two or three vehicles a week, whereas we're still building 25 or more diesel chassis on the, on the same chassis line. Um, so there will be a phase out. I did see about lead time as well. It's, it's about 26, 28 weeks, I think, okay. at the moment for an e-collect so there's a limit to how many we can build and of course we've also got to source the components the batteries yeah. the motors and so on so it takes time to ramp up those type of things and there is still a very uh, good uh, benefit in using the euro six diesel vehicles and as as brian said we at 320 horsepower, we can offer the HVO or the, the Bio 100 within our warranty um, yeah. allowance. So that's why probably it's a good five years or more before we really see big numbers starting to go through. Okay, brilliant. Okay. Well, I think we'll probably wrap up there because coming up, coming up for the last few minutes, anyone else? Um, like to end on did you have anything you'd like to end on andy for the day um well the main thing is get people trying it they will like it i'm sure and uh we'll see more and more of them about because they do make a big impact on air quality and noise levels as well yeah they seem a perfect solution don't they for uh, yeah. especially for urban waste collections but as you've demonstrated today also for rural ones as well just with the right route planning in place sounds good exactly. Okay. And, not, and, and Jack, what about yourselves? What, 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 what's your hope for, for the fleet at, at Nottingham for the next five years then? Uh, just, to, yeah, just, just keep going electric, really. And just to sort of okay. encourage people, other people to do so and get involved. Um, so sort I've of really get the ball rolling on it. Um, and just sort of to go back to what we said earlier. Um, yeah, the Uli framework is there. That's, the, that's a good starting point for the people as well. And uh, yeah, just don't be shy, get involved. And the details for people to get in touch about the framework um, were on the end of Matt's or, or slides, yeah, weren't or they? they? So, if they people want, yeah. Yeah. so if you look on, on the web, webinar tomorrow, you'll be able to get all the details from there. Uh, and Brian, anything you'd like to end on? Uh, no, just very, very generic. Um, obviously, we're, we're here to, uh, to accelerate this transition, uh, but there are barriers and blockers uh, still in, in the way in all sorts of sectors. Uh, and we rely on our, our members and the experts within our to engage with us to, to tell us where those barriers are and develop the, the solution. So um, uh, do, do, do get involved. My email, of course, is on the slides, which I think you're going to be circulating, Hayley. That's what, yeah. So every, everyone will be able to log in and watch yeah, all the slides again. Well, drop us a note uh, and let us know what, uh, what your issues are um, uh, and indeed what um, successes you're having. And we can all uh, work on this together. There was just, oh, sorry, Andy. Go yeah, on. there was just one other point that we've made a PDF pack available on, us on of the slides. So those two or three slides that were missed. <laughs> They are available within that slide pack. We'll get those out to everyone. Yeah, yeah. We'll, we'll get the slides out to everyone. Um, and like I say, you'll, you can also watch it on, on demand tomorrow. So that's perfect. No, it's been a really good session. Thanks, guys. I can see everyone's yeah. been really engaged. There's been loads of questions um, and it, I've really enjoyed it. So thank you very much. Um, and yeah, brilliant. Thanks. Thanks, everyone. Bye-bye. Yeah. See you later. Thank you. Bye-bye.